I want to continue our thought today, if I might, about uh, the revival of the church and our <clears throat> opening our lives to God in a way that he can surely move us to do the work of an evangelist. Let me uh, say to you that that every great evangelistic effort in the world is of great preaching. Believe me, it's not. It's been because men and women sitting in the pews Savior and Lord, and took him seriously when he said, go and make disciples of all people. Took him seriously. <clears throat> Every preacher in the world, and unless the pews decide we're going to do something about this, nothing will ever happen. It has to begin with you. And most of the lay people that I know that are outside the church believe that the preacher gets paid for what he does. Do you understand where I'm coming from? The preacher gets paid for what he does. When you do it, you do it for nothing. You do it because you care. You really care. Not that I don't care. But they think, know that you care because you're doing it. No reward yet. In 1811, <clears throat> one of the great men of this century, not this century, but of the last three centuries, met with a group of his generals and uh, some politicians that were with him to talk about the successes that they had had in prior, prior to its or years. And they had a big map around the wall. And as they met and talked, he pointed out places that they had invaded and conquered and are now in charge of that country all across that part of the world. And then and the Napoleon Bonaparte didn't say that's who I'm talking about. And then he finally, as he moved across the world, trying to tell them what all they'd done, how successful they'd been, they came to one place on the map with a huge circle around it. And Bonaparte said to the people, this is one place that you don't want to tinker with, because if you fool with these people, they are a sleeping giant. They will rise up and destroy you. Now, he was talking about China, talking about China. If you fool with these people, they will rise up and destroy you. Now, we're told today by the world's economists that China is number two in, uh, as a number two economy in the world today. And most economists will agree that within 15, 20 years, it will be the number one economy in the world. And at the same time, while a lot is happening economically in, with China and some other parts of the world, there's also an explosion of Christianity in the country of China. Thousands and thousands and thousands of men and women are being won to Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord because of the lay people that took upon the obligation of being evangelists, simply sharing the faith with their neighbors and friends about what Jesus Christ has done for them. Now, we're told today that about a third of the people of China are Christian. Now, that doesn't sound like very many in China, you know, a third. 
but that's a lot compared to where it had where it was and where, where it had been. The whole country is experiencing again a genuine Christian revival among the society in China. The same thing is true in South America. The same thing is true in Korea. The same thing is true in Africa. Do you know, you maybe haven't met any of these yet, but do you know that the other countries around the world are sending missionaries to America to do missionary work? You say you haven't met any yet, huh? Well, you will. You will. Just give it a little time. They know that America is a, a great place to do evangelism and to build churches. The church in America is on the decline. It has been for the last 50 years or more in America. The only place in the United Methodist Church that is experiencing growth today is in the South. Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, those places. Down South, Deep South, they are experiencing growth in the life of the church. That's not true in West Virginia. It is not true in the Baltimore Washington Conference. It's not true anywhere else in Methodism. It's not true. In 1968, when we had the union between the Methodists and the EUBs, we had 11 million me members in the United States. You know how many we got today in the United States? Eight million members. Eight million members in 40 some years. Eight million members. I've told you this before, but I want to reiterate because it's, it's very important that we get this. In West Virginia, we had in 68, 122,000 United Methodists. Today, we have less than 90,000 members in West Virginia. Now, that may not say anything to you, but it says a heck of a lot to me. It scares me and worries me because I know we in the pews are not getting it. We are not getting it. We have 1,500 churches in, Amer in West Virginia today with 50 members or less. They're not big enough to do mission on their own to really do it effectively. And consequently, they continue to go down and more churches slide into that 50 members or less every year. Now, I'm telling you, you may, you may say, well, that's not us. Well, I can tell you now that we're not a whole lot bigger than we were when I came here. My plea this morning is that we would be serious about this and realize that God depends upon each of us. Now listen to what Jesus said to the disciples. Prior to Pentecost, after his resurrection, the disciples were gathered in an upper room, scared to death, captured by fear. There was little enthusiasm for the faith among them, Timidity in witness, there was hardly anyone who would dare to witness about Jesus Christ. Little conviction that they had found the truth and that he'd really been raised from the dead and was alive forevermore. And Jesus took that motley group and said to them, Go into all the world and make disciples of all people, but wait, he said. Now, this is a secret, in my opinion, to you and to me and to the work of the church. Wait, he said, until you are endued with the power of the Holy Spirit. Forty days later, the church were, was gathered together, and they were praying. 
And suddenly there was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Cloven tongues like as a fire fell upon them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Friends, that church took off like an airplane when they received the Holy Spirit. Jesus is not in the world today except through the Holy Spirit. That's the only way he's in the world. He is not here except through the Holy Spirit. He said, Jesus said, if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. But if I go away, I'll send him. And he came at the day of Pentecost and the church was born of God that day. <laughs> the first thing you know, there were so many people that had need in the communities that the church was just befounded because they couldn't provide all the need that they had. The apostles had more than they could do. They were, they were called to preach the gospel, and they were having to help the sick and the poor and the needy. And they got together and they said, we need help to do this. And so they said, let's look for seven men. Now, now what, what do they want in seven men? Let's look for seven men of honest report, that they had integrity, seven men of integrity, full of the Holy Spirit. They had to be full of the Holy Spirit. Let's look for seven men, I'll report, full of the Holy Spirit, and put them in charge of administering to the widows and the needy people in the community, and we'll preach the gospel. And they said to the church, we want to do this. The church said, that's great, let's do it, and they did it. One of those men that they chose was Stephen. Now, Stephen was a man who was stoned to death with his clothes laying at the feet of Saul of Tarsus. And as he was being stoned to death, as he was dying, he looked into heaven and saw Jesus standing. He said at the right hand of God and prayed, Lord, lay not this sin to the charge. God threw an anchor in the heart of that man who stood beside the clothes that day by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And on the road to Damascus, God brought him to his knees. And Saul said, what would you have me to do, Lord? Oh, that we would make that statement to God. What would you have me to do, Lord? What do you want me to do, Lord? I don't know what he wants you to do, except I know he wants you to share his faith and share his love and share his concern. I know, you, I know he wants you to do that, but I don't know what else he might want you to do. Nobody knows that except God and you. <clears throat> Friends, when Jesus returned to heaven and the angel said, if these men fail me, fail you, whatever, what other plan do you have? He wept and said, I have no other plan. And he is saying the same thing here at Williams Church, at Ubella Church, at Bethesda Church. If the people in those churches fail me, I have no other plan. There is no other plan. We can't fail him. I beg you don't fail him. Open your heart and mind to the gift of God's Spirit. Ask him to fill you and equip you, give you whatever you need to be able to be his witness. And then as you come in contact with your neighbor and as you live beside them, live with them and work with them, share the faith. Share the faith that Christ loves them. I know that there's a multitude of people out there looking for something that they haven't found. 
Oh, somebody might tell you to mind your own business. So that will not deter you. But you can say that this is my business. They might say something else to you in derogatory, but that's all right. <coughs> Just keep on loving them. Keep on praying for them. And keep on witnessing. Keep on witnessing. You know, the problem with most of us today is that our actions speak so loud, people can't hear what we say. Our actions speak so loud, they can't hear what we say. <clears throat> if that's not true, why do we have 150 or 60 members in this church and 45 or 50 here today? Act and speak so loud you can't hear what they're saying. My prayer is that God will revive us and send a great revival to us because we've given ourselves to him. Don't let the world around us squeeze us into its mold, but let God remold our hearts and our minds from within that we might know to do his will. I'll tell you this much now. <clears throat> I want to talk about this next week. But the joy that you'll receive from being filled with the Holy Spirit, you have never experienced joy like that if you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit before. It's out of this world. Out of this world. Out of this world. <clears throat> we must be faithful to him, to his calling. We can't let, we must not let the world around us change us and make something of us that we are not. In 1958 or 9, there was a small community in and I had a church, one of my churches, one of four churches was in it, a student pastor. And one day I went into, went into the store in the community and, and I said to him, he had just started opening his store on Sunday. And I said to him, I said, Jerry, why are you opening this store on Sunday? And he said, well, why is that, Pastor? And I said, well... People, people will buy enough on six days a week. You don't have to open it on Sunday. And he said, I wish you would tell that to your people. You get it? I would not be opening this door on Sunday if it weren't for your people who come here wanting things in this store. I can remember when they wouldn't think of having a soccer game on Sunday morning or a basketball game or a baseball game. Nobody thought about that. Oh, people said that, then blue laws. It was honoring the Christian people and the church. The world around us has squeezed us into our, its mold and made us from without. We've got to break loose. We've got to break loose and break those shackles and once again be captured by God so that we can capture the community for him. All that explosion going on in China and Korea, South America, it can come here to America again. <coughs> there isn't any reason why it can't. It will. <coughs> we will know again that he's done something for us. I was up with Bethesda this morning and <clears throat> one of the fellows was telling me <coughs> about, a <coughs> about a small church that started out with about <coughs> 80 members in it. Today it's got <coughs> five years later it's got 1,500 members. And Jerry was telling me <coughs> Well, I shouldn't have mentioned his name. But he was telling me, he was telling me about what a great preacher they had. I said, Jerry, 
all the great preachers in the world couldn't have done that. If they were all there, they could have done that. That church reached out and grew because people in the church reached out and touched the lives of people in Boston. That's the way it grew. Believe me, that's the way it grew. It wouldn't have grown any other way because we, by the help of God, will make it happen, and it will happen. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. What? 454. Eyes that I might see. May this be the truth for you and me as we sing today. Our Father, your mission and ours is together here today. Would you help us that we might enter into this with great enthusiasm and great joy. Grant us your presence and power. In your name we pray and amen.